You've seen it in all the films about knights of the round table, chivalry, and the Middle Ages in general. Two heavily armored people charge towards each other, mounted on horses. They both carry shields in one hand and long wooden lances in the other. Usually there's a lot of cheering, generally for the one in the shiny armor, because the one in black is a no good bad nick. Eventually the two meet up, and depending on whether this is a drama or a comedy film, hit or miss each other. Down goes the no good bad nick if this is the third act, and the kingdom and or princess is saved. Some of the films that do more than hand wave a bunch of history might change this formula a bit. Sir Shiny Armor might be unhorsed and all looks to be doom and gloom, but then remembering that they carry swords as well, the no good bad nick will then have to face down the hero on foot, man to man, wielding nothing but a massive great limb chopping sword it takes two hands to use. Or maybe he sneaks in with a dagger to really show how bad a no good bad nick he really is. Hiss boo hiss, or shiny armor eventually wins anyway, roll credits. The basic formula for all of the jousting we see in films was established starting in 1928 with a French film called The Tournament. Catherine de' Medici is mediating the usual dispute between the Protestants and the Catholics in 16th century France, and in doing so promises the hand of one of her ladies to a Protestant nobleman in exchange for him working towards peace between the two factions. Unbeknownst to anyone, the lady-in-waiting is already deeply in love with, you guessed it, a Catholic nobleman. Naturally, the Protestant is the bad guy, and the Catholic is the good guy. And yes, the film's director, Jean Renoir, son of the famous painter, may have had some subtext in mind which was not, in fact, very sub. Anyway, after the Protestant kills the lady's brother and then flaunts his, um, acquisition of the maid to her Catholic suitor, things can't help but end up in a joust, as was normal at the time. The two combatants square off and the Catholic wins, of course. Now this might seem like the start of a successful formula, but it would be another 23 years before the idea really caught on because no one really pays attention to French cinema. In 1952, Ivanhoe, starring Robert and Elizabeth Taylor, would appear. In 1953, Knights of the Round Table with Robert Taylor and Ava Gardner hit screens. And in 1954, Prince Valiant, starring someone who was not Robert Taylor, Robert Wagner, and Janet Leigh opened to audiences around the world. By then, the damage had been done. Suddenly, all the jousting and knights fighting and whatnot was just like we described. Two men in single combat trying to murder each other with big sticks while somehow riding horses. Good stuff. A whole lot of fun to watch. Even better to incorporate into your game. Very exciting. And also completely wrong. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The first of the several problems with the popular image of jousting has to do with its origins. There's a tendency to think that this was just a thing your basic medieval knight did, perhaps out of some sense of gamesmanship and non-violent dispute resolution. Those old chivalrous knights just kind of came up with it as a way to entertain themselves while waiting for the next season of Who Wants to Be a Crusader to start. In fact, what we think of as jousting actually was just a small part of a much larger series of games called a hastelude, which comes from the Latin for lance games. Jousting was just one of the many games played and fell into a class of games known as martial games, that is, games intended to demonstrate and improve those arts of fighting necessary for combat. When we started out to write this episode, we thought it would be pretty easy to just go in, explain what jousting was all about, how the knights started out using it as practice for war, then gradually developed it into a martial game, and then finally into a sort of performance for the benefit of the local king and queen. That would have been sufficient for our purposes. Along the way, we'd have pointed out one or two little intricacies and expanded the possibilities for you and your game, and then we could all go home happy, secure in the knowledge that we'd all learned something useful. But then, we discovered that we'd been using the language all wrong, and that we couldn't even call it a jousting tournament without running afoul of the original usages of both the word jousting and the word tournament. At that point, 
we began to suspect we were going to be in trouble and have a lot of work ahead of us. See, jousting was just one sort of game that came under the heading of Hastelud, but so was tournament. And it came to mean something completely different by the time Hastelud's fell out of favor than it did when it was first used. And suddenly, every usage of the word tournament in modern times is suspect as well. Here's your problem, and we really are handing it off to you, because our heads are already turning. Which was, sort of, what tournament meant. To turn. It came from Latin by way of Old French in the 12th century, and finally ended up in English by the 1300s. As used by the French, it referred to jousting, or, as it was sometimes called, tilting. So, to say a jousting tournament was to say a jousting jousting. You see? The word joust itself came from the word joster, which meant approach or meet. Over time, the word tournament came to refer to all kinds of martial events, let's say, as carried out by knights, while the word joust came to mean a duel between two knights instead. But, and here is where things start getting kind of fuzzy in the historical distance. It might have been that the original tournaments were less a regulated series of sporting encounters between individuals than they were an open melee with everyone pitching in at once. The whole idea of the tournament seems to date back to ancient Rome, where great battles were more or less, mostly less, accurately recreated, or in many cases just made up to watch people fight. Part of the tournament, then, was, as the Romans had done in their loose reenactments, the chasing back and forth of one side by the other, until a general melee combat was joined by all and sundry. Sure, some of what we think of as jousting might have occurred, but it was incidental to the general mock combat as a whole, and it wasn't just night-on-night -night action. Remember that cavalry wasn't really meant to go against cavalry. It was developed as a way to rapidly close the distance between melee troops and ranged combatants before they could fill everyone on the opposing side with pointy sticks, and to rapidly attack foot soldiers before they had time to form up and react, generally with pointy sticks of their own. As a knight, you didn't really want to go up against another knight in combat. You were both so heavily armed and armored that the ensuing conflict would make both of you much less effective at dealing with all the rest of the enemy who wasn't knights as you ate up time and energy fighting each other. For every knight you took down, you could have been getting rid of a dozen or so of the regular infantry or more. Mostly what the jousting in the tournaments was for was to reenact heavy cavalry charges against less mobile unmounted troops with the idea of breaking up or preventing their formations. So the phrase jousting tournament contains two mutually opposed ideas. On the one hand, a man-to-man -man joust, and on the other, a mass combat with many participants. You can begin to see why it gets confusing. Have you ever seen a film where the school bully, surrounded by his sycophantic followers, and so very full of himself, prevents the geeky kid from passing through a doorway by standing in the middle of it and demanding that the poor, tortured kid fight his way through? We're willing to bet you never suspected that the bully was engaging in yet another highly chivalrous martial game, the pas d'arme, or passage of arms. The passage of arms involved a knight and a bunch of his friends finding a convenient, well-traveled spot and basically blocking it up until some self-imposed requirement was met. The idea being that no one could pass their location until such time as they had either fought with the knight, being a knight themselves, or admitted their cowardice or, in fact, been a woman. If you were a knight without weapons or horse in your immediate vicinity, these would happily be loaned to you for the duration of combat. If you elected not to fight, you had to leave a token behind, say, your spurs, to indicate your cowardice for all to see. If you were of the unescorted lady persuasion, you would be required to leave a glove or scarf behind which, subsequently being rescued by the next victorious knight, would be returned to you at a later date. One famous account out of thousands tells the story of 15th century Spanish knight Suero de Quinones, who, along with ten of his best buddies, held up passage on the bridge into Santiago de Campostela for an entire month in the summer of 1434. Naturally, right in the middle of prime pilgrimage season. The road normally saw the passage of thousands of pilgrims from all over Europe, and each time a knight came along, Suero would challenge him to a duel, a practice he and his friends 
vowed to keep up until they broke three hundred lances. Yours or theirs, it didn't matter. By the end of the month, the eleven knights had fought one hundred sixty-six battles, and were so badly wounded they declared victory and went home. Thus, earning Swero and his knights a place in history, a published account of their time at the bridge, and a mention in Don Quixote. Not bad for a bully looking for a fight. Other hastaludes included melee and bohard, in which participants would simulate mounted cavalry combat, a quintain in which each person involved, knight or not, would charge at a series of targets with their lance, either with or without horse, and something no one knows the actual rules to called tuppenair, that involved combatants attempting to strike each other three times. The first to deliver three blows in each of three duels involved was declared the winner. And it turns out, we all really misunderstand the goal of jousting and how it was done. What little is known about the tuppenair sort of illustrates that point. Once you understand how jousting was meant to be conducted, the tuppenair sounds a lot like jousting light, or speed jousting if you prefer. Probably some sort of medieval X game meant to get more jousts per unit of time than the traditional method. By the traditional method, we of course mean jousting as it was practiced from the 11th to 14th centuries pretty much throughout Europe. As we mentioned, the whole point of jousting was originally to practice for war. However, this practice gradually evolved into a game in which two combatants would ride at each other and have a duel. While the lance is very large and impressive and certainly gave some people ideas, it wasn't a requirement of the original jousting game. The riders could just as easily decide to attack each other with pikes or swords or maces or whatever else they had to hand. Some jousts might start with a lance, but once the distance was closed, switched to swords. There weren't multiple passes, it seems, just the one, with the fighting breaking down into close combat once the two fighters met. And there was very little that was nice about the whole thing. The point of a joust during this period was to incapacitate one of the riders and then take all their stuff, horses included, and maybe collect a ransom while they were at it. As such, both sides would bring additional people with them whose job it was to join in against the other side the moment it looked like someone was losing. One way to make sure someone was definitely losing was to do as Count Philip of Flanders did during the mid-1100s and turn up with all of your armed men in tow and then decline to join in until long after all the other knights were exhausted from the combat. By then, it was easy to just sweep in and collect all the ransoms you could want. Mostly, though, Jousting was just the preliminary to the main attraction of the tournament itself, the Grand Charge, in which everyone participated as best they could on the actual day of the feast, event, or festival the people were observing. More than once, though, between the actions of the Count Phillips of the world and the numerous injuries suffered by knights in the joust, jousting itself would be banned from these tournaments because it distracted knights from the main event, which was really what everyone wanted to see. Still, by the early 1200s, jousting had begun to develop its own following, and events were organized outside of the framework of the tournament. Soon, the knights were more interested in the joust and its own unique rewards than they were the tournament itself. So the tournament soon began to decline. In 1223, John Dobellin, Lord of Beirut, held the first jousting-only event on record, apparently an elimination-style roundtable event for knights and squires alike. Probably the use of the words round table in that sentence in connection with knights means something significant to Arthurian legend, but far be it from us to point out the obvious when there's a giant oak table in question. Anyway, it all proved so popular that by the 1400s, jousting was the thing to do, and true tournaments were on the way out. It turned out rich people with expensive equipment really liked to show off against other rich people with expensive equipment man to man, and so we see that nothing has changed in 500 years or more. The joust was in, and tournaments were out. Of course, the other reason tournaments died out when they did was because it was customary for the town picked to host the tournament to foot the bill for the whole thing. You'll recall from some of our discussion of the various kings of England in our King episode that if a royal were to travel down your village road, that road became a royal road and so the local village was taxed to provide for the royal road's maintenance and upkeep, a tax that was so egregious that at least one village all pretended to be insane so the reigning king would avoid the place and the tax couldn't then be levied. Well, in 1379, when the Count of Flanders announced a tournament was going to be held in the city of Ghent, 
the locals rioted due to the cost, often as much as five years' worth of wages for some folks. No one wanted to foot the bill for all the extravagance just because someone higher up the chain thought it would be amusing. But even as tournaments were fading out and becoming costume dramas full of political messages and symbolism, the joust still pretended to some purity of form and function. That is, right up until chivalric romances became all the rage in late medieval Europe. After that, all attempts at any real authenticity went right out the window. We've covered them a bit before, but in brief, chivalric romances were stories told in both prose and verse, full of the most fantastic, marvelous adventures in which knights errant would go on quests, rescue damsels, and pretty much be the most heroic guys you could imagine. And what better way to indicate the level of heroism they exhibited than by showing them in the deepest throes of pure love and with the finest and courtly manners? They were basically a harlequin romance mixed with the finest in pulp action novels. And people ate them up. In fact, Don Quixote, which we mentioned earlier, was a burlesque, that is, a work that poked fun at an earlier, more serious genre of literature, of the whole chivalric romance thing. Written in the 1600s, Miguel de Cervantes has the nobleman Alonso Quijano lose his mind after reading too many of these romances. Calling himself Don Quixote, Alonso sets out to restore the ideas of chivalry to Spain by engaging in martial combat with anyone not following chivalric code, almost all of which he loses. The tragedy of the novel, of course, is that while the world might be a better place for it, it has nonetheless moved on from the old ideas of chivalry brought forth by exactly the sorts of books that caused Don Quixote's delusions in the first place. There is, of course, much more to it than that, but if we told you all of it now, you'd never read it for yourself. The point is, the ideas of chivalry that came from the chivalric romances changed the way jousting was perceived and conducted in much the same way they changed all the other aspects of medieval life. Jousting went from more or less chaotic mass combats to refined affairs with well-defined rules of conduct and politeness that meant you couldn't just do what you liked. First, the point of jousting was no longer to incapacitate your opponent and take his stuff. The lance tips were blunted, and the intent of the charge was now to either break your opponent's lance, shield, or armor, or failing those to unhorse him. It was much more exciting to hear the clash of arms and armor and see the splintering of the lance than it was just to break bones. It just wasn't spectacular enough. Besides, the presence of actual blood tended to upset people. Of course, it wasn't okay to be too good either. A knight wasn't supposed to take advantage of his opponent's weakness and spent a great deal of time during the actual joust trying to work out how to appear to be fighting against the odds even if his opponent was clearly at a great disadvantage by reason of, say, having a broken arm, since this appeared more honorable. Fortunately, things rarely got that bad. If you were in that bad a state, it was expected that in the name of honor, you would yield to the dominant fighter. Combats were no longer expected to be lethal, as not only did this reduce manpower and a knight's ability to raise an army when the king called, it really brought the mood of the festivities down. Sparing your opponent's life had nothing to do with being the good guy, it was just part of the rules. Pretty soon, every castle worth its salt had its own jousting arena or list, usually at least a roped off area for the combat to occur, but often including banners or walls to keep the horses separate as they approached each other. The actual combat was broken down into at least three rounds of three encounters with various named weapons the traditional joust with Lance being just one of them. You can now see how the Tupanere was intended to speed things up. Most importantly, though, through all this combat, it was seen as dishonorable to actually wound your opponent. That's right, swing away with these lances and swords and daggers and things, but don't you dare injure anyone. Not even a little. Not even if you were already fighting over something else. The English in 1380 were on campaign in France yet again. As they advanced into the region of Beauce in northern France, a challenge was sent out from a nearby castle. 
a squire from Buse, a gentleman of tried courage who had advanced himself by his own merit without any assistance from others, came to the barriers and cried out to the English, Is there among you any gentleman who, for the love of his lady, is willing to try with me some feat of arms? If there should be any such, here I am, quite ready to sally forth, completely armed and mounted, to tilt three courses with the lance, to give three blows with the battle-axe, and three strokes with the dagger. Now look, you English, if there be none among you in love. The challenge was accepted, and guaranteeing the safe passage of the French squire, a joust was arranged. The Englishman that was to tilt was brought forward, completely armed and mounted on a good horse. When they had taken their stations, they gave to each of them a spear, and the tilt began, but neither of them struck the other from the meddlesomeness of their horses. They hit the second onset, but it was by darting their spears, on which the Earl of Buckingham cried out, Hola, hola, it is now late. Wanting to get on with the actual armying, the Earl had them postpone the rest of their skirmish until a later, less busy day. Fortunately, a feast day was coming up. On the day of the Feast of Our Lady, the two men were armed and mounted to finish their engagement. They met each other roughly with spears, and the French squire tilted much to the satisfaction of the Earl. But the Englishman kept his spear too low, and at last struck it into the thigh of the Frenchman. The Earl of Buckingham, as well as the other lords, were much enraged by this, and said it was tilting dishonorably. But he excused himself by declaring it was solely owing to the restiveness of his horse. Then were given the three thrusts with the sword, and the Earl declared they had done enough, and would not have it longer continued, for he perceived the French squire bled exceedingly. The other lords were of the same opinion. The Frenchman was therefore disarmed and his wound dressed. The Earl sent him one hundred francs by a herald, with leave to return to his own garrison in safety, adding that he had acquitted himself much to his satisfaction. Imagine, you get challenged to a joust, win the joust, and still have to give the loser a prize, even though you're invading the country anyway. You can sort of see why movie-style jousting became so popular, can't you? You've been listening to GM Word of the Week, for which we thank you. July has been a busy little month, hasn't it? Of course, we're grateful to our sponsors as well. Sponsors like all the people who have joined our Patreon and helped make the show possible. Because with them, we don't need any other sponsors. Which is nice for you, because we aren't telling you about personal grooming devices right now. Also on our short list of people to thank for helping the show are the folks who bought some of our merchandise, like stickers and coasters and whatnots. We're happy you found a way to contribute as well. If you're not already on the bandwagon, why not head over to our support page at gmwordoftheweek.com and click on the yellow banner at the top of the page. You won't regret it. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who wonders if the armless, legless Black Knight was really just trying to preserve his honor after all. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions, makers of fine tunes for the masses. What I want to know is, in the Middle Ages, did they do anything for housemaid's knee? What did they put in their hot baths after jousting?